Cool. cool. Loud. Cool. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Brent. Um, my co-presenter is Sean Devonport. Um, <laughs> the astute among you may have noticed he's still in Grahamstown. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't make it today, but he has provided some videos and voiceover to help explain certain parts of the project. Hopefully, you can all hear them quite nicely. Yeah. So, the topic of my talk is hearing the internet background radiation. Yeah. And if you don't know what that is, I guess you're going to find out. <laughs> yeah. So, we'll just go into introducing myself and I'll introduce Sean. Talk a little bit about network telescopes, talk about data sonification, what we built, and what we think about it, where we think this might go and where we think it can really be used. Yeah. Now, before I introduce myself, I need a show of hands. How many people scanned the QR code? <laughs> oh, oh, good. If, if you say which QR code, that's fun too. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes, maybe. Um, but uh, I'm sure you've all learned a valuable lesson not to just scan QR codes and trust <laughs> Google shortened links. Um, so that's a good intro to the talk. <laughs> cool. So Sean Devonport, a colleague of mine, He's an audio engineer uh, currently completing a master's at Rhodes University. His focus is in what we call immersive audio, um, so dealing with largely multi-channel sound systems. Uh, basically, your 5.1 or 7.1 home theater system is inadequate. 20 speakers or more is where we're at. <laughs> um, he deals with big immersive audio systems and trying to best locate sounds within a 3D space using multi-channel speaker systems. Yeah. He's uh, worked on lots of audio projects and won some pretty good awards. Um, and he was the kind of co-presenter on this talk. Yeah, this is Sean. He's here in spirit and hopefully in voiceover should the speakers work nicely. As for myself, my name is Brent. I'm currently completing my PhD at Rhodes. Um, actually in cybersecurity, this talk borders on cybersecurity, but there's a lot of audio stuff happening. So just bear that in mind. <laughs> uh, but if you'd like to contact either Sean or myself regarding anything, ask some questions, or maybe try to get a hold of this tool, please let us know. Um, I'll put these up at the end for anyone. Yeah. So we'll start off with network telescopes. Um, has anyone here actually heard of a network telescope? Yeah, a few people. Cool. Um, it has nothing to do with normal telescopes, just so that you know. It's not like a radio telescope either. Yeah, network telescopes are basically dark pieces of the internet. Yeah, large numbers of unused IP addresses that lie dormant and don't respond to anything. Yeah, that sounds a bit weird. Yeah, but we're literally talking about segments of the internet where we have IP addresses that, if you pinged them, they do nothing. If you go to them, they do nothing. They don't respond. They do not accept or acknowledge your TCP uh, requests. If you try and open a connection, you get nothing. They are, for all intents and purposes, unused IP addresses. Yeah? They are dark. Yeah. Now, that's a bit odd. Yeah? And as I've said here, they passively capture all network traffic. Yeah. Now, what that really comes down to is Anything that hits a network telescope, since we never sent a request, and since it's supposedly an unused address, anything that hits our network telescope is unsolicited. We never asked for it, and it should never have got to us. Yeah. So this basically brings most network telescope traffic um, into the category of either malicious or misconfigured. Yeah. Basically, we get You'll see on a network telescope port scans. You'll see all kinds of interesting things, malware, people trying to discover what's out there, trying to find out if that is being used. Maybe you've got a server there that just doesn't respond. Yeah? But after going through a network telescope, if you've got one with a whole, um, uh, something like a slash 24 network, yeah? if none of those IP addresses respond, it should be well assumed that there's nothing there. Yeah? And our network telescopes work exactly like that. They sit there and they just monitor for these unsolicited requests that come in. Yeah. How many requests? Um, about, about a gig, 
up between 1.2 to 1.6 gigs a month yeah, of traffic we never asked for, <laughs> yeah? which is always fun because that's, that's the traffic we're really interested in. Yeah? If we didn't ask for it, why is it there? Yeah. And why is it there is a very interesting question. Yeah? Fundamentally, the traffic that is being sent to us is non-productive. Yeah? It is mostly, as I said, either malicious or misconfigured. Sometimes it's just backscatter. Yeah? Sometimes it's reflected traffic. Yeah? But quite often, it is simply people provide, scanning the internet, looking for open hosts, open ports, looking for things to attack. Yeah? And of course, malware trying to spread itself. Yeah. And the kind of interesting thing about this is we're finding this on dark internet. Yeah? This is traffic that is everywhere. This traffic exists everywhere on the internet, but it's generally hidden to us because we only look at the traffic that was actually meant for our servers. Yeah? This is traffic that's generally hidden in amongst legitimate traffic. But on Network Telescope, where there is no legitimate traffic, we can expose it and we can investigate it. Yeah. This makes it a very interesting thing to look at. And what we call this, we call this the internet background radiation. Yeah? It's always there, it's always present, and it's just odd, yeah? It's basically noise, yeah. Now, as far as malicious things go, um, flooding, uh, vulnerability scans, lots of scanning, obviously people just looking for low-hanging fruit, um, worms, malware, yeah? All kinds of things are gonna try and just look at random ports or random RPs on the net and see what they can get, yeah? And our, a telescope is gonna record all of that, yeah? but it's never going to respond. Yeah, so we're not actually going, it's not a honeypot, it's not going to try and engage, it's only going to capture that traffic. Now, what this means is when we look at telescope data, we're actually hunting for trends. Yeah? We're looking at noise and trying to extract meaning from it. Yeah? Now, a lot of this falls into these various forms of research. Yeah? Either we're simply going to total up the number of request, requests to that IP address, we can try to look at which ports are being accessed. Try to you know, see, is there a current trend this month for a favorite port? Yeah? Uh, you've all heard of Mirai, yeah, Mirai botnet. It has some favorite ports. <laughs> yeah? And you can see that, as we will see moving forward. It becomes very obvious when these sorts of things start to appear. Yeah? But this is generally how internet background radiation and network telescope traffic is approached with these forms of research, yeah? Now, uh, maybe it's just me, not all of this is my type of fun, yeah? Uh, I think there's more fun to be had. Um, as much as I enjoy totaling things up, um, I enjoy poking them a bit more, yeah? So we thought, you know, can we do better? I guess the short answer is probably not. Um, but we can certainly do it differently. So we had this idea that we could take this traffic and try to look at it in a different way. Yeah? And when I say look at it, what I actually mean is listen to it. Yeah. So data sonification, has anyone heard of data sonification? Like a few like half raised hands. Yeah. Out of the people who have heard of it, uh, do you know any examples of it? <laughs> sound of the sun, okay. So there's a lot of sound of the sun, the sound of Saturn, solar winds. Yeah. People try and take data and convert it into some form of audio. Try and listen to it so that we can see if it sounds interesting. Yeah? And a lot of the time it does. Yeah? But even more of the time, it just sounds like noise. Yeah? Because we expect it to sound like music when actually we're talking about raw data. Yeah? Raw data does not just automatically sound cool, <laughs> as we will see. <laughs> yeah. So a big portion of data sonification is trying to make it sound cool. Yeah, trying to take what could just be, um, you know, radio telescope data looking at Saturn, trying to take that and just convert it into audio. Yeah. Now, that requires quite a lot of processing, and the more you change the, the data, the more you kind of fit it to make it sound really nice, the less it is accurate. Yeah? And I'm sure you've all probably seen this with info, uh, infographics. Yeah? Some of the best, nicest looking infographics don't actually convey a lot of information. They look really cool, they've got very nice colors, 
But making something that looks great and tells you a lot at the same time is actually a very, very difficult task. Yeah. So sometimes we can misrepresent data when we're trying to make it more appealing. Um, this is you know, something we have to look at when we're trying to sonify data. Yeah. And data sonification does offer us some other interesting concepts, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Yeah. So, as I said, some examples, the sound of Saturn and solar winds. Yeah, these are common things, um, or I wouldn't say common. These are two specific sonification projects that actually gained quite a lot of traction online. Yeah. Now, they also took a little bit of flack, yeah, because a lot of them changed the data or manipulated it quite heavily to make it sound great. Yeah. And we'll look at why that is. Um, data does not have a good sound when you just make it into audio. Yeah. Um, I would love to say that you can just take uh, you know, telescope.pcap and change it to telescope.wav and play it. That's not how it works. Um, but there are a few advantages to sonification. Yeah? How many people here have lovely 60 hertz monitors and enjoy that really high speed refresh rate gaming? And, and, and the people with like 120 hertz? 240? Ooh, <laughs> 240 is really high. Yeah, 240 hertz is fast, right? Yeah, for, for visuals. It's nothing for audio. Yeah, our hearing range, we often deal with up to around 20 to 22 kilohertz. Yeah, we hear much higher frequencies than we could really see. Now, that being said, they can't be directly compared. Yeah, I will say that. You can't just compare those things. But in general, we can pick up very, very tiny changes in audio long before we can pick up the equivalent as a picture. Yeah? If you've ever heard the first quarter second of a song and recognized it, yeah, it's very seldom that you see the same frame of a movie and automatically know what it is. Okay, our ears are very great at pattern, our ears and our brain are great at pattern recognition and hearing small segments and figuring where the rest fits in. Yeah. Now, Another thing we can do with sonification is we can deal with what we call like higher dimensional spaces. Yeah? Mostly, we hear things with stereo. Agreed? We've got two ears. So that's a good start. We can only hear on the left and the right. But we are capable of perceiving things in front of us, things above us, things behind us. Yeah, we are quite good at actually figuring out where sound comes from. And we can leverage this. Yeah? Because very easily we can encode sound into a surround space, either using a surround sound sound system, or we can do it using headphones, which is a very, very cheap method of doing it. Yeah? Very cost effective, because buying an immersive VR kit is not very cheap. Yeah? Being able to do virtual reality sound has a very low barrier to entry, which means we can apply 3D spaces very easily to this type of data. Yeah. So, what we thought is maybe this pattern recognition would work with the internet background radiation. Maybe we could hear things and spot some patterns. I'll, I'll let you decide. So, this over here, if I can get to VLC. Music to my ears. Okay. It is distorting a little on the sound system, unfortunately. Yeah. Zoom it in a little bit so that you can listen. But I just wanted to walk you through what you're actually looking at and what you're hearing. Yeah. Now, please ignore the crude visualization um, 
on short notice, this was the best that could be thrown together. <laughs> Unfortunately, I thought hearing it would be the easiest. Just let you hear it and see what you think. Yeah? But it's easy, I think, if you can associate what you're hearing with what's actually being processed. Yeah, so our, our map over here is showing the source of each um, packet received by our telescope. Yeah? So the little ellipses showing up where the packet originated and is showing the port um, that that packet was destined for. Okay, so we've, we're mixing packet source with destination port. Yeah. And that is being translated into audio. Yeah. In this case, you'll hear like a lower rumbling sound. Yeah. In this case, we're highlighting port 23, just so that we can pick it out of the sound more easily. Yeah. Yeah. We can also increase the playback speed to cover a large number of packets in a very short amount of time. Take the time. So that's about three weeks since we increased the playback speed. Three weeks worth of packets has passed just since we increased the speed. Yeah. Now if we just stop there, we can see quite a few things. Yeah? That's where traffic's coming from. Yeah? Traffic we never asked for. Interesting stuff. Yeah? But something you might also be noticing, this is a mad amount of data, right? Yeah. We can't just look at this. Certainly you would not want to comb through this PCAP. I guarantee you your RAM does not want you to open it in Wireshark. <laughs> um, I can just tell you it doesn't, it's not. Um, so, being able to play through a PCAP or being able to play through a traffic capture gives us quite a few advantages. Okay? We can see events within a certain amount of context. Okay? Saying that we received a lot of port 23 traffic from Russia, that's great. What does it mean? Was there any traffic coming from anywhere else? Was it just Russia? Was it a distributed attack? Yeah? Was it an incorrect router? Yeah, being able to both visualize it and hear it gives us a lot of advantages. Yeah. Unfortunately, as you can see, um, I've tried to make the visuals like hang around. So I've made the ellipses kind of fade out badly, I might add. It's not great. Um, <laughs> but the reason I've made it hang around is, although our ears hear that sound, if I'd have made that just flash on the screen for only the duration or the instant that that packet was received, you wouldn't see them. Yeah. They're fading out to give you a better idea of what's actually happening. But notice you're hearing all of it. Yeah. Does anyone think they're really hearing much? <laughs> Does anyone think this sounds like noise? So, uh, everyone should be like. <laughs> yeah. So this is noise. I mean, this is our internet background radiation. Yeah. So we're trying to come out with a really great way of listening to it. But as I said, raw data generally doesn't sound good. Yeah. Cool. Now, I will come back to another demo, and we'll look at a few more instances of this data. But before we do that, I think it's a good idea to know how this is working. What are we actually doing? Where are we getting the sounds? What's actually happening? Now, the system we built can be broken down into four major components. Okay, we've got um, the capture streamer, the thing that actually deals with our PCAP file and produces our audio events. We have a control application that allows us to play, pause, uh, and accelerate our time scale because obviously when we're dealing with months and years of data at a time, being able to play through it quickly is quite important. Yeah, there are, I think uh, this is January 2018. It is 12 million events um, in the first month of the year. Yeah. Now we've got a lot more data than that. Obviously being able to go through that if we had to play it back in real time would just be too much. So being able to control and fast forward through things makes a big difference. Yeah. The next thing we'll look at is how we've actually done this using something called a granular synthesizer and how we're encoding it into surround sound. Yeah. Now, something just to note, you are hearing this obviously using stereo speakers. It's not surround sound. Unfortunately, 
Um, if you'd like to hear it in surround sound, I'll try to get it set up. I've got a nice pair of headphones here. You can come find me afterwards, and I'll let you listen in surround sound where you can actually hear the different sounds appearing around you. Okay. In stereo, a lot of the effect is lost. Yeah. But hopefully it still conveys the point. Yeah. So with our capture streamer, we've got these massive captures, and we'd like to be able to play them back. Preferably, one of the thoughts we had is we'd like to be able to play them back to multiple endpoint processes. Yeah? So if we just have one device that actually processes the PCAP, it would be great to have a team where each member in the team can receive that stream of data and process it in their own way, but at the same time. Yeah. So, for instance, one person could be looking at visualization, one person could be focusing on sonification, but only of low-level ports. Yeah. One person can train this or hone their sonification synthesizer to only focus on ports used by, let's say, Mariah. Yeah. They can change their parameters to let them identify a specific malware or a specific attack. Yeah. Now, the ability for us to do this and to use multiple endpoints adds a massive increase of usefulness to this because we can switch out what's actually happening at the end. This is the visualization you saw there is basically two separate endpoint processes. One that was doing the visuals on one machine and the audio being processed on another. Yeah. Now the idea is we can scale that up. Yeah. The way this works, our peak app is read in and basically, we're using MaxMind's Max Mind's Geo IP database to look up our source. Yeah? And we're, from that, we're getting our latitude and longitude. Now, the nice thing about this is we'd obviously like to be able to use that information. Plotting it on a map is great, but on a 2D space, we can't see a heck of a lot. Yeah? So what we're actually doing is we're taking that latitude and longitude and we're transposing it into, if you can imagine, an orb around your head that is the globe that is our Earth, yeah? we are placing each sound at its location in the globe. Yeah. And MaxMind is giving us that through the latitude and longitude, and we are using something called ambisonic encoding to put it into that 3D space so that we can play it back on headphones. Yeah. All of that gets packaged up as OSC messages. OSC is a very boring and basic UDP protocol that allows you to send out data very quickly. It's got, it's got some problems. But the nice thing is there is a ton of stuff that already uses OSC and is very easy to integrate. Yeah. So we can build tools to run at the endpoint very quickly. Yeah. Now, as I said, this means we can do lots of different processing, focus on different things, have entire teams looking at dashboards that only focus on their individual tasks. Yeah. Um, if anyone here has seen Yeston's Arnetviz application, yeah, a possible extension to this would be piping this data through to that so that you can actually see it in time windows as a little 3D cube of activity. Yeah? So you can actually plot ports and port scans and see it in a different way. The whole idea of this is trying to come up with different ways to visualize and hear data. Yeah? Now the control application um, is very, very basic. We'll have a little bit of a look at it. But at the moment it allows us to play, pause, scale playback, and do some experimental controls. Right now, the experimental controls are around adding effects and changing the sounds that we generate. Yeah. Just so that we can highlight things like pick a port and change how that individual port sounds. Yeah. Obviously, to make audio useful, it needs to have some kind of logical mapping. So in our kind of 0 to 65,000 ports, it would be really useful if we could map that to something similar. In this case, we're mapping it to frequency. So our low-level ports get mapped to our audible hearing range from your low frequencies at 80 hertz. And our highest ports get mapped on a log scale so that our known ports up to 124 are exaggerated over our hearing range so that we can hear more of them. Yeah. Since our high-level ports are a bit harder to track, yeah, when an important one appears like 20, uh, 2323, we can use our experimental controls to select that port and assign it a specific sound. Assign it a noise. If you really wanted to, you could make it sound like a kick drum. Yeah? But the nice thing is it means we can pick a port that wouldn't have been that important, but is starting to pick up in popularity, and we can single it out and listen to it. Yeah. The kind of not yet done stuff of the control application are things like reverse playback 
and full scrubbing. Okay? In audio, the ability to scrub, so to click and drag through an audio file backwards and forwards is very key. Now, if any of you have dealt with PCAPs, yeah, that's not how it works. You can't just run backwards or forwards through any file. Yeah, the PCAP data structure, basically each packet tells you the position of like how long it is and you can figure out where the next packet starts. Yeah, that means you can't just arbitrarily jump forward. If you are at packet one and you'd like to jump to packet 50, you don't know where that is. Yeah. That means PCAP, just to begin with, is not a great data structure for doing this type of work. Yeah. We've worked around it and we've built scrubbing data structures that you can load a PCAP into, but obviously that uh, has a bit of a RAM and complexity cost, a bit. Um, but obviously this is work we'd like to look into to give us more flexibility and be able to deal with PCAPs in a way that we've never really dealt with them before. Yeah. This is our control interface, and instead of talking about it, um, I'm going to have Sean talk about it. Hopefully you can all hear Sean. Hey everyone, this is uh, the control patch or see him. Maximus P uh, program. Uh, essentially, we're sending out packets or the critical data from the packet being the longitude and latitude uh, coordinates and then at the moment we have the frequency of the synth match to ports. Um, so I'll just give you a basic run through Can you all hear? of that or at least of what the control patch does. Um, here I am. Uh, if I press play, we should start hearing some audio. If I turn on the thing. Yeah. It's quite soft, unfortunately. So, so you can hear that, that side. Um, and, that's um, and that's just a random packet capture we have from the network telescope. Um, with the control patch, I can obviously uh, speed up the audio. So at least speed up the frequency that the, the packets are sent. And then I can slow them down. So, so one of the cooler pe uh, features, features, at least, of this is that, is that I can add effects. So I'm going to add delay effect on. And at the moment I'm in the background of this max patch, and I can change that to a reverb. You should be hearing the demos. And then another nifty thing I can do is I can solo a port. Sometimes we still have to fine tune the actual patch because sometimes uh, the way that we're doing the audio is it includes some of the other packets which it shouldn't be doing, or at least the different ports frequencies. So if I slow it down, you'll hear that that's working correctly. Where is that? It's an interesting port. Seven, I think, was quite an interesting one. So a lot of this is exploration. <laughs> we don't know what we're looking for. <laughs> kind of get the idea. Uh, we, can uh, we can also highlight, highlight ports uh, using, uh, using the noise, the noise feature. feature. So that'll be noising, noising that port. Port 23. Port 23. So that distorted uh, sound is port 23. Mm. And then I can also affect the port. The moment, the moment it's on 873. Sorry, I wrote 837. And for some, and for some reason, 873 is getting a lot of pings. Um, so let's so do that. So there you can hear just port 873. Yeah, so we can single out and filter down to listen for a specific track, it, uh, specific traffic. Going. Now, one of the things that became quite obvious when we were doing this is certain types of traffic have certain timings between them. Okay? When you leave the playback speed constant, you do start to recognize, uh, I hate to use the word rhythm, yeah? but you can actually start to notice what feels like certain timings between packets. Okay. Now, I can't say we've done a thorough look into why that is and what exactly we're looking at. 
Yeah, there is simply too much data. But this is where I think sonification does hold quite a lot that we can look into. Yeah, we can hear those patterns. We don't know why they're there. Yeah? We're not sure, but we can hear a pattern and know that we've heard it before. We can recognize it even if we don't know what it is. Yeah. Now, the next step in this kind of application we built was we built a synthesizer. Actually, let me just check time. Cool. Plenty of time. Okay. So we've built a synthesizer. Yeah. And the whole idea of the synthesizer is to take in our important events, our internet events, and create sounds from them. Yeah? Now, the way we're doing this at the moment, we can change our, our what we call mappings. Okay? So we can take our timestamps. At the moment, we mostly use them to delay our packets, okay? to put gaps in between. Now, that makes sense because we'd like to play them back like audio. If we played them back with no delay, it would just be pure noise. Yeah, we gave it a go to see if maybe it was a quicker way of hearing the data. It's not. It's terrible. Yeah. We use the destination port primarily for frequency. And something we've played with is changing the source IP for frequency. Now, when people are doing things like certain forms of network scanning, if they're scanning IP address ranges, yeah, if the destination port is set as frequency, it's hard to tell. It sounds like you're just listening to a DOS attack. Yeah? You just hear the same port being hammered over and over again. Yeah. Now, we changed the source IP to deal with frequency, and then you can actually hear a sweep through the frequency range as it starts low and moves upwards through all the different IPs on the network. Now, something to bear in mind, that's if it's doing a straightforward 1 to 255 style scan. Okay? If you've ever used Nmap, yeah? has anyone here used Nmap? I'm hoping, OK, good. I mean, whew. yeah, that makes the next bit a bit easier. So who here has actually used Nmap, done a capture of that, and looked at how it works? Fewer hands. <laughs> yeah, it's, when it does a port scan, I can tell you it's not in order. Yeah, that makes sense. An in-order port scan would be a bit obvious. <laughs> yeah, and it would stick out like a sore thumb. That doesn't mean they don't happen. Yeah, every now and then, we hear a small scan on small ranges people scanning only the lower ports in order, yeah, which is a bit odd sometimes. But they're generally doing it over a very long period of time. Yeah, they're not doing it immediately. It's a slow thing. But because we can accelerate our time scale and our ears pick up that pattern, we can play it back really quickly and we still hear it. Where if you were looking at that visually, it would be very hard to follow. Yeah, you would have just seen a lot of noise in between. Yeah. But to make things easier, we've changed what we can actually map to frequency so that we can actually try and listen to different things. Yeah? And the location, as I've said, from our geo IP database, we're trying to position the sound around the listener. Our granular synthesizer just provides a different form of synthesis. Yeah? We can, realistically, we could replace this with any other style synthesizer, but our granular one deals with layering microsamples. Because of the amount of data we're dealing with, we thought this might be a great way to highlight ports, to have them get louder as we receive more packets, and to have samples build as we get a higher number of um, packets from a specific IP, from a specific source. Yeah. This needs a lot of fine tuning. Okay? It's a great idea, and I think with some work it will come out and provide some good results. Yeah? But it is new, there's a newer form of uh, synthesis at least compared to some older stuff which means it's a lot harder to tune and to get it to sound good and clean. Okay. As you've heard, it can sound a bit raw. Yeah. Making things sound great, not always part of sonification. Yeah. Now, this is probably a little hard to follow. This is our synthesizer. Yeah. It's probably not the type of synthesizer you've seen before. Yeah. Basically, we have our grain synthesizers. They receive packets, or the packets that we send at least, and they translate all of that into audio. Yeah. Now, I will make all of this available if anyone would like to play with it. Yeah. The patches and stuff, the data. The data, on the other hand, is something else. Yeah. Now, we'll go to one more thing from Sean.
Hey everyone, I'm hey um, just giving a quick rundown of the Ambisonics plugins. I'm not going to try to do this in the list in a minute. Um, yeah, Ambisonics was developed quite a while ago, but it's being used in VR and gaming quite a lot now. So, the basic idea is that you are able to map audio locations around a sphere. Uh, those audio locations are held within a uh, set number of channels. So for this uh, instance, we have 64 channels, which relates to 7th quarter ambisonics. Um, without getting too deep into the technical technicalities of it, um, the basic idea is that the higher the order is, the more channels you, you need, but the higher the resolution of spatialization is. Um, the cool thing about ambisonics is that you can actually encode all of these you can encode the channels and then decode them at a later stage. So if you have a surround rig at home or something, you can take this encoded format and just decode it without having to like remix or do anything like that. So that's super nifty. So yeah, speeding along, uh, I'll show you the basic way that it works. Um, sort of why we thought it would be great for the telescope and geo IP databases and things like this. Um, so here we go. So you can see the thing flying around, um, and that's corresponding, corresponding to where the sound's coming from in the sphere. And off. So yeah, that essentially sums it up. I um, thought it would be a great idea to map the locations of the, the IP addresses to Ambisonics, and it came out pretty good, we think. Uh, still hoping to listen to it on a more multi-channel rig, which will obviously make uh, it really feel like it's coming from below or above you. Uh, headwinds can only do so much. Anyways, thanks a lot. So this sphere over here relates to our globe. And as you saw that dot jumping around, okay, those are our packets coming from different countries. Yeah? And they are encoded around us, so we can hear them specifically where they come from. Now, the first time you listen, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah? When you add the visualization and you can see, for instance, where packets from China are, you very quickly actually start to hear that area, and you can very quickly identify locations based on the sound around you. Yeah. It does take a little bit of listening, but you get there surprisingly quickly. Yeah. So, our thoughts so far? Well, is it good? Eh. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, I think. Yeah. I think it offers a very different way of viewing telescope data and viewing what essentially is noise. I mean, we're, we're trying to pluck meaning for information from so much noise. And I think that listening to it is possibly a way to do that. Yeah? Does it need to be good? I actually don't think it does. Yeah? We would love it to sound great. I mean, we would love to you know, have a YouTube video that says, listen to the sound of the internet and you know, get a million views. But no, I don't think that's really necessary. Yeah? I think having data and being able to listen to it and still extract some kind of meaning from it is all we really need here. Yeah. Are there other synthesis techniques that might serve us better? Who knows? Yeah. There are certainly cleaner synthesis techniques, techniques, and some of them may provide a better result. We would need to do more research, figure this out. Yeah. We did a bunch of tests using SynFloods, port scans, Mirai, Blaster, some of these become very obvious. So this is not telescope data. This is individual captures aimed at only looking at one event. Yeah. Now, on their own, they don't sound like much. But when you repeat that and you go look at different captures of the same attack or the same event, that Nmap port scan actually starts to sound familiar. Yeah? Even though it is quite like random, it's not just a linear scan from 0 to 255, you actually start to notice this quite quickly. Yeah. And you do start to hear things. And we've done a few tests where we've listened to things, stopped when we thought some, we heard something interesting, and gone back to check. And I'd say, we're not always right, but it does sometimes work. Yeah. And this is early days. There's still a lot more that can be done. Yeah. A few points. DOS attacks are obvious, painfully so, as in your ears hate you. Yeah, it is the same port, the same, um, it, it, unless it's distributed, okay, at which point you hear the same frequency coming from all around you. 
Yeah, it's actually a surprising thing to hear for the first time because suddenly you actually feel like you're attacked. It's an interesting thing, yeah? And, I mean, it's an attack, so cool. Um, same port scans. Uh, some port scans are obvious, not all of them. Yeah? As I said, Nmap, it's less obvious than you might think. Yeah? Um, and amongst noise, we can pick out events. Yeah? And I think this is something that's quite important. Cool. Some problems, as I said, PCAP, not for scrubbing. There's a lot of data, and there's so much noise. Yeah? Some kind of filtering before we sonify would certainly help us a lot. Yeah. Trying to root out data that is most likely useless would certainly help. Now, there's a lot of research that's done that, so I think we can probably apply that and get results pretty quickly. Yeah. There's a lot we can do going forward. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip past it. But there are a lot of artistic uses for this in either art installations and sound or music installations. Yeah? which is where a lot of sonification ends up going. Yeah? And often it might not accurately represent the data, but it does start to get people interested in the data, which I think, once again, is quite important. Getting people interested in this is always a good thing. Yeah. So in conclusion, the most important thing, the internet background radiation is not music. It's noise, which is what we expected, but it is noise that we can pick patterns out of. Yeah? Small patterns in a very vast sea of noise, but I think that's a good starting point. Yeah. And as I said, I think it's interesting to listen to nonetheless. Cool, and that's it. If anyone would like to hear more, see more, just find me. Yeah, any questions? Cool. Uh, I'm gonna start at the back, his hand went up. Sorry? I think come talk to me afterwards about that. So uh, if you'd like to know more about the telescope data itself, that's something you should come talk to me about. Okay. Um, so this is mostly research work at the moment, right? Is it when you say research work. We could... I think okay, you I'm could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So that is certainly something you could use. You could certainly use this as an audio dashboard of sense. Yeah, exactly. yeah something you could listen to in the background and possibly pull events out very quickly. Yeah. This is research. You, in that sense, yeah, we are not there yet. <laughs> yeah. This is not a tool that you can download and play with right now, um, but hopefully soon. Yes. When? Where, where? Oh, GitHub. Okay. Um, if you, so my email address, either my email address or Sean, or you can come talk to me afterwards. Um, well, the plan is to release the patch so that other people can try, kind of hone it in on better sound. So we haven't. Um, Generally, the one problem with listening to actual gateways and actual traffic is as soon as you receive like a TCP stream you know, destined for an individual port, it's basically just hammering your face. Um, so <laughs> once again, yes, I think we can do that. It will be a very interesting application. Um, we haven't focused on that here, but I think it's something that would be cool to look at. Is it lunch? Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, yes, it is lunch now. Um, everything's available around where you got all coffee from. You need your little slips and, yeah, grab. Um, the next talk is starting at quarter past two. Yes, quarter past two, so in an hour. Back here.